Okay, we're taking a look now at the uh, Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. Uh, looking first at Saint Domingue. Um, Saint Domingue was the Caribbean colony uh, from of the French that is located in uh, the Caribbean, later called Haiti. This is regarded as one of the richest colonies in the world. Um, has about 8,000 plantations. A big majority of the population is slave labor. Probably so, or around 500,000 um, people make up that majority of the slave labor force, whereas about 40,000 um, what would be considered um, white population there. Um, there are other groups of people um, that are there, uh, merchants, lawyers, um, those known as petite blancs or poor whites are a part of this too. There's another 30,000 of a social group that consists of gens de couleur libres or free people of color. Many of them are mixed race background um, and such. The French Revolution or the ideas of the French Revolution will spark violence within this colony here. Uh, it lights several fuses and sets in motion the, uh, the, the what takes place on Saint-Domingue. Um, the revolution itself is going to mean different things to different groups of people. Um, you're looking at... Uh, the Grand, uh, the Grand Blancs or the rich white landowners, it's going to suggest greater autonomy for the colony and fewer economic restrictions on trade. Uh, those white groups are going to be adamantly opposed to the insistence of uh, free people of color that the rights of man mean equal treatment to them regardless of their race. The slaves, the promise of the French Revolution uh, was a personal freedom that would change their ideals. So beginning in 1791, a massive revolt is going to take place that will trigger, uh, was triggered by rumors that the French king had already declared an end to slavery. The slaves will burn a thousand plantations um, and kill hundreds of whites as, as well as mixed race people. Soon you have these warring factions of slaves, whites, and free people of color battling one another. Spanish and, uh, uh, Spanish and British forces seeking to kind of enlarge their empires at the expense of the French will add to that turmoil as well. During this time, we'll start to see uh, the revolution becoming a war uh, between a bunch, between those different groups and power will gradually shift to the slaves. They are led by a man named Toussaint Louverture. Uh, he himself was a former slave. He also has a, has a successor who overcame the eternal race and they outmaneuver all the foreign powers and defeat an attempt to even take them over by Napoleon. When the dust is going to settle, um, it's clear that something remarkable has happened in this place. Um, you are going to see the first slave revolt that is successful okay, uh, in world history. The country itself is going to be renamed Haiti. Okay, means mountainous in Taino, which was the original inhabitants of the place. The Haitians identify themselves with the original native inhabitants of that island, and they declare equality for all races, plantations, and they're divided among, uh, all, excuse me, the plantations are going to be divided among the small farmers that existed there. The destructiveness of the revolution, uh, the internal divisions and external opposition will lead to, excuse me, poverty, as well as, um, oh, excuse me, unstable politics. So independence debt happens. The French force upon Haiti a debt that they were supposed to pay to them. That pay is going to last for a long time. Um, eventually what takes place is the success of Haiti 
uh, and their independence is going to give a great hope and also great fear. Um, it creates new insolence among slaves elsewhere um, and will inspire other slave rebellions. It causes horror among the whites and leads to something called social conservatism. Eventually, uh, what we see is a tightening okay, uh, on, on, on the slave trade. So while slavery is increasing everywhere else, plantations claim uh, Haiti's market share of things. And Napoleon's defeat in Haiti convinced him to eventually sell the Louisiana territory to the United States and change the way we viewed those ideals. This portrait is an early 19th century engraving. It's titled Revenge Taken by the Black Army. It shows a black, uh, the black Haitian soldiers here um, hanging a large number of French soldiers, illustrating kind of the violence and uh, the racial dimension and upheaval that was taking place within Haiti itself. Next, the Spanish-American revolutions from 1808 to 1825, really talking about the, uh, the Spanish, uh, or excuse me, the Latin American revolutions themselves. Um, so they are also going to be inspired and motivated by the earlier revolutionary movements that existed. You have the native-born Creoles uh, in the Spanish colonies of Latin America that are offended at the Spanish monarchy's kind of efforts to control them within the 18th century. So <clears throat> Latin American independence movements are very limited at first. Um, there's very little tradition of local self-government within this area. Um, the society itself is more authoritarian than it is anything else. There are very strict class divisions within this. And the whites are vastly outnumbered during this time. So the actual changes that take place within this are huge. When we look at it as well, the Creole elites really had a revolution thrust upon them by the events that took place within Europe. In 1808, Napoleon invades Spain and Portugal and puts royal authority all in disarray the Latin Americans are kind of forced to take action on their own there. And most of Latin America is going to end up being independent by 1826. This here, guys, is a map uh, with the exception of Haiti. Um, on it there, the Latin American revolutions brought independence to new states, but offers very little social change uh, or political opportunity for a majority of the people that were there. Gaining independence within Latin America is going to take a lot longer uh, than, than most places. Latin American societies are really torn by the castes, or excuse me, the class system that they had going on there, race and regional divisions as well. There's also fear of a social rebellion from below that shapes kind of the whole independence movement itself. Um, leaders of that independence movement appeal to the lower classes in terms of what's called nativism. All people, uh, all free people born in the Americas were Americanos. So this idea of nativism really uh, pushes itself forward within this. Um, many whites and mestizos regard themselves as Spanish. But many leaders are very liberal in this, and they're influenced by the ideals of the Enlightenment and also the French Revolution. So in reality, the lower classes, Native Americans and slaves, got very little benefit from the actual uh, independence movements that were there. Um, women gained very little independence from those movements as well. And it proves almost impossible to unite the various uh, Spanish colonies unlike it was in the United States. There's a larger distance that, ha that they have covered uh, for, in, a, in geographical terms here. The colonial experiences were vastly different and there are much stronger regional identities that existed. 
Whereas if you look at the American Revolution, it's a much smaller area that, uh, that was uh, being kind of influenced. Um, they had somewhat of a similar goal and it wasn't necessarily to change a whole bunch. It was more looking to keep things the same. After uh, Latin America goes and gains independence, traditional relationship with North America will gradually reverse itself. The United States actually grows wealthier. They industrialize. They're more democratic and internally influential uh, in a lot of ways and much more stable. <coughs> the Latin American countries, however, they become increasingly underdeveloped, more impoverished, and uh, undemocratic in a lot of ways. They're politically unstable and dependent on really the foreign and, and technology and investment that they uh, needed to have in this area. This portrait here shows one of the uh, heroic figures of Spanish America in the independence movements. This is Simon Bolivar. Here he's shown riding through his town, his hometown of Caracas in present day Venezuela. Um, Bolivar is going to be immensely disappointed in the outcomes of the independence of itself. His dream of a unified kind of South America uh, will perish amid a lot of rivalries and separate countries that take place here. So he never truly re, uh, gets the, uh, the unification that he wanted. Um, okay, the abolition of slavery. Um, slavery was largely ended around, around the world between 18, excuse me, 1780 and 1890. Um, the Enlightenment thinkers themselves were increasingly critical of slavery. Um, American and French revolutionists focused their attention on the slaves' lack of liberty and equality. You have religious groups like the Quakers, Protestant evangelicals, become increasingly vocal in the opposition of slavery and a growing belief that slavery wasn't necessary for economic progress. A lot of this is taking place within North America amongst the Northern colonies. Um, three major slave rebellions in the British West Indies show that slaves were discontent. There's brutality that, uh, that is a part of that. The suppression of those is appalling to many people. Uh, there's a bunch of abolitionist movements that go with this as well. In 1807, Britain forbids the slave, um, uh, the sale of slaves within its empire. In 1834, they emancipate all slaves within their empire. Other nations are going to follow suit 50 over the next 50 years. Uh, Latin American slavery ends around the 1850s, and Brazil is really the last to do so in 1888. You even have uh, Russian serfs who are going to be emancipated in 1861. And so there's resistance to a lot of these ideals that's taking place here. Um, there's resistance to the abolition movement. Uh, it's vehemently strong amongst different groups of people and the, and, and the parties that had existed within it. Okay, this here is a uh, portrait. It's from uh, an image depicting an African, uh, an enslaved African in chains on the deck of a, uh, of a ship. He's holding a knife there. Um, this though is, shows the subjects kneeling and praying and pleading in most cases, but this one is much different in a lot of ways. So, um, excuse me, I went ahead one too far there. So when we look through this, uh, we see uh, the abolition often doesn't lead to the expected results. Usually there's very little improvement in the economic lives of, foreign, uh, of former slaves. There's an unwillingness of former slaves to work on plantations, and that leads to a new wave of global migration, especially coming from India and China. Few of the newly freed uh, really gain any kind of political equality. Uh, in Russia, the serfs there remain very much impoverished, and more slaves are used within Africa to produce things like export crops. In the Islamic world, you see slavery persisting, but freeing slaves is going to start being encouraged in those areas. Okay, um, 
That is it for today. We will continue with nations and nationalism as we move forward in our next lecture.